Good morning, church, and welcome home. We are so happy to see you this morning, and I think you're in for a real treat this morning. I think God's going to bless us. We've got some great music and a so-so preacher, but uh, we, we, we are here this morning to, to serve the Lord. But before we do anything, Miss Judy, where is Miss Judy? She has some announcements for us, and then I'm going to have some announcements also. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first thing, I would like to give you some reminders. Uh, faith promise for 2024, now is the time to see how God is working so that you, can, you are able to fill those promises that you made back in October. The crisis care kits, there are still bags out there on the NMI table, bags and lists, and we will be collecting those all the way through May. Um, and there's a big box out there that you can put those in. Uh, the homeless bags, there are still bags and lists on the NMI table. There are some good stories from those of you who've already filled out some bags and have them in your car to hand out. Child sponsorship information is on the NMI table. For $30 a month, you can change a child's life. Uh, th and $30 really isn't a whole lot when we think about um, how much things are costing now. Uh, now I would like, uh, I want to introduce you to the NMI team. I don't do this by myself. I have some great helpers. Hopefully most of them are here. Just wave your hand. Carl and Andrea Purcell are our Lynx connection. Uh, you'll be hearing more about Lynx in a minute. Mary Lou Stewart is also our Lynx person, and um, Ann Beavers is our links connection to the Great Gantz. So if you want to know anything about our missionary links, talk to any of those people. Uh, Ken and Alita Glover are our memorial role and distinguished service award leaders. Cheryl Redder is Compassionate Ministries, and Joan Webb and Karen Ben, they were our uh, Operation Christmas Child coordinators. Links. Uh, each district is assigned a missionary or missionary family for the year. It gives us as a church the opportunity to get to know our missionaries, pray for them, and care for them during the year that we are assigned to them. This year, our Lynx missionaries are Russell and Carla Frazier. They are in Nairobi, Kenya, at Africa Nazarene University. You can get more information about them on the NMI table. They have a website, and they both also have Facebook pages. I encourage you to check them out and begin to pray for them in their ministry in Africa. Work and Witness is an opportunity each year for us to become involved in short-term missions. Last October, our district sent a team to Argentina. This year, there's going to be two opportunities. In July, a team will travel to Fawn Grove Compassionate Ministry Center in Maryland to help with organizing items, including crisis care kits. That's where we send our crisis care kits, and then they ship them off. If you remember, there were some that they shipped to Maui in August. In October, a team will go to Peoria, Illinois to serve at the Southside Community Center with Irene Wimberly. She's a dynamic and loving missionary pastor in the poorest zip code in the state of Illinois. Registration for both of those teams begin in February, and they really like it when teenagers go. Uh, and then last, we will be collecting for Alabaster Offering in February. You can get your boxes from the NMI table and begin collecting your extra coins and cash. And then if you have any questions, you can see me or any member of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Judy. Thank you very much. I want to give some announcements before we begin the service. Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, after the Bible study, the prime timers are going to Gilligan's for lunch. Come out. Let's de uh, dive deep into the Word, and then we'll dive deeper into lunch. Um, Saturday, the 20th, that's this coming Saturday, from 8 to 11, we at the church, we will be hosting our first cop stop, and, and that's also first responder stop. So we are inviting the first responders from Berkeley County and Goose Creek and the police and all of those to come and have breakfast. So we'll be cooking breakfast for them this coming Saturday from 8 to 11, and we'll probably have to start cooking by about probably 6.30 or 7 o'clock, something like that. But I think we've got the cooking part of it pretty much handled. But if you'd like to come out and be a part, please do so. 
Next Sunday, the 21st, that's next Sunday, the pastor will be hosting a town hall meeting where we all just get together and he will tell us um, some of the things that we've already accomplished, some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. It'll just be a, a good time to learn about what's going on in the church. And that's 3 to 5 p.m. next Saturday. Oh, excuse me, Sunday, thank you. And then January the 25th, which is on a Thursday, our prime timers, again, are going on a day trip to B City Zoo in Cottageville, and I'm upset because I can't go. Um, but they have a sign-up sheet in the back and information on the back tables if you would like to go. And then finally, I think that was finally, uh, Calvary Outdoors is Saturday the 27th. They're doing a 5K beach walk, and information and sign-up is in the back. And just check your weekly updates for other information. I'm going to ask our uh, ushers to be ready when the first song begins. We're going to ask our ushers to come forward and receive our offering. And I'd just like to ask you to stand and let's worship the Lord. Thank you. Shining in the light of your glory, 
sings a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a For this next song, I, I do want to share one of my favorite verses. Um, it's Hebrews 13:5, and it talks about 
trusting God. Um, he will not forsake you, nor will he leave you. And it just talks about that connection that he wants from you and with you is anything that you go through, he's gonna be there. And so a lot of times that when we go through things, um, we can't do things to our full potential because we're scared. Um, I was about to trip, so it made me a little scared. <laughs> but um, the next song, You Are My All in All, you, we cannot give him our all unless we trust him. Just like a lot of things in life, you can't give your all unless you trust the situation. Um, so as we sing all in all, just keep in the back of your mind, Hebrews 13, five, he will never leave you nor he will forsake you. And that's how you give your all. You can't give your all unless you hold on to, to the, the fear that you have of what happens. You know, if I fail, if you fail, it's not really failing. It's just figuring out you don't work that way. Um, but I know a lot of you probably do know this song, so please just sing it with us. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup.
Praise God. Father, we just thank you today that we have an opportunity to sing to you, worthy is your name. Because, Father, you are so worthy in all things you are worthy. You are holy. You are that which we need. And, Father, we just thank you for who you are. And I know, Lord, in a congregation this size, there are those that have special needs, prayer requests. And so, Father, I just ask this morning that you would touch everyone who has a need in their life. May you minister to them in a special way. May you send your ministering angels to them, Lord, and may you touch their lives in a special way. And Father, I pray this morning that you will give me your anointing to bring forth your word, as I am incapable on my own. But Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I just ask this morning that you would bless your word, that you would bless this message, and that you would be with us, Lord, in a very, very special way. As you know, or as you see, Pastor Rod is not here this morning. Uh, they are up in Myrtle Beach having a great time, and thank God for that with the pastor's retreat. But I'm going to continue along this morning, pretty much along the same line that he started us in last week, about letting go and leaning in and journey deeper. I guess probably all of you know, if, if not, I, I would be surprised that I love to run. I've done it a lot in my lifetime. But I want to tell you a story, a true story about a runner who wanted to go beyond what she thought she could do. She pushed herself. And as I read this story to you, I want you to put this story into your life in a spiritual way. Think about what she did in a physical way and how you might do that in a spiritual way. Now, first of all, let me clarify by saying, if you don't know what an Ironman competition is, it is a competition where you swim two and a half or yeah, 2.4 miles then you bicycle 112 miles, and then you get off the bicycle and run a marathon 26.2 miles. The math adds up to 140 miles these athletes do in one day. There's a cutoff time of about 17 hours, but I just saw where one of the fastest times ever done to do 145 or 140 miles was 7 hours, 12 minutes, and 12 seconds. But here's a lady that in 2008, she decided she wanted to push herself. So she signed up for the Ironman competition. She had run some marathons before. Her name was Lana Sane, and I want to read just what she said. Here's Lana's reason for signing up for an Ironman competition. She said, because I learned that if you don't actively take a stand against it, the nature of the world will ever so slightly dull your senses soften your will, and limit your amazing natural-born capacity. It will lie to you. It will beat you down. You will forget who you are. And at the time you least expect it, life will throw you a curveball it knows you won't be able to handle. You won't see the beauty of the sunrise because you'll be asleep. You won't feel the stillness 
of the night because you'll be engrossed in reality TV. You'll opt out of the game with your little one because you can't catch your breath. You won't take a risk because you might fail. You won't enter the event because you might not win. You won't consider the unthinkable because you see yourself as average. You won't ever know what you could have done or who you could have been. I knew the journey to Iron Man would strip me of all the unnecessary baggage and clutter in my life, and I, it would get up, all up in my face and show me again who I really am. I knew it would, I like this one, I knew it would force me to shut my mouth for once and stop complaining and stop making excuses just to watch, listen, and learn. Somewhere amid the neurons of my subconscious, I knew that I would be left with no other choice but to accept that I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Psalms chapter 139. This is a story of commitment, dedication, and sacrifice. Now, I've been reading some things in the last couple of weeks, and I came across an article that talked about church apathyism. They call it apathyism, church apathy. How to overcome spiritual apathy. Now, you might say, well, there's no spiritual apathy in our church, everything. You know, we're doing well. Everything is fine. No problem. But let me read you. Well, it's not changing for me for some reason. Could you go to the next slide, please? I don't know why it's not changing. All right. Thank you. Let me see if I can get back into it. All right. The problem. The, it, um, a Nashville-based Lifeway research company in 2021. Well, this thing keeps taking me back to the start, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. The surveys, they surveyed 1,000 pastors in about a two-month period. And they asked them, what was their greatest, what was their greatest problem? Let me go out and try again. This is why I, I this is why I brought paper. <laughs> I, I, I don't trust technology. Well, let me put it this way. I don't trust me with technology. So I'm going to try to go back into this and see if I can get it right. All right. But they did this amazing survey. 75% of pastors said this. Apathy or the lack of commitment was their primary church challenge. That's the thing that 75% of the pastors said they dealt with. This, I'm sure it's probably me, but this keeps going back on me. And then there was another group in Venturi, in Venturi California. It's called the Barna Group. They did a survey in 2018. And they said that 35% of Generation Z considered themselves either an atheist, an agnostic, or not affiliated with any religion. Compared to 30% of millennials and 30% of Generation X, but only 25 or 26% of the baby boomers. So what you see is, as time has progressed, 
and we have our children following behind us, they are less interested in the kingdom of God. There's a total apathy with some of them. They have much more that they would be concerned about, but it even gets worse. This Barna Group survey that I just quoted, they also said this, apathy has bled into theology with most Christian parents not, and this is amazing, not having enough biblical literacy to even pass down to their children the most basic tenets of faith. We wonder why our children, our grandchildren are walking away from the church. I saw one gentleman that said they are post-church or post-Christian. There's not enough knowledge with their parents. And it, the next one said, only 2% of parents of preteens, and they're in the uh, at a time of worldwide thought development, only 2% of these preteens have a biblical world view largely because, and this is what upset me, only 2%, because parents are too distracted or too disinterested to acknowledge and address the parenting crisis. We're talking about the church, folks. We're talking about the kingdom of God. And those that are following behind us are leaving the church because they have not been taught the basic tenets of faith. Their primary answer when you talk to them about Christ, this is what they say. I don't care. It's not, some of them may not be atheists, they may not be agnostic, but their th worldview is, I just don't care. I don't care if there's a God. I don't care if whatever happens, happens. I don't care about God. I don't have time for God. And that's the world we live in. Church, what have we done? Where have we let our children down? Where have we let the next generation down? In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul calls on Christians to be more careful to follow what we are taught so that we will not stray from the truth. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the enemy is busy at work. Satan has not taken a holiday. He's doing his job. And he's turning many away from the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14, and uh, actually, I'm going to go to 17, but that's all right. Verses 3 through 16 are here, or 14 through 16. But Jesus was talking to the church at Laodicea, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he made this statement. He condemned the church of Laodicea for its indifference toward him. That's what Jesus said. And he said, I know your deeds, that you were not cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but because you are neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He went on to say in verse 17, here's what the church said. You say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. But you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
I think our churches, many of our churches across the world fit that category. They're not hot. They're not cold. They don't care. They've stopped preaching messages about Jesus and came to messages about good things. Things to make us feel good. Well, sometimes hard work is not feel good. But the end result is positive. Just like that young lady that did that marathon. It, she spent, she would get up early in the morning before her children would rise and go out and run. She would come back and get her children off to school. She would go out and swim. And then at night when her husband came home, she would ride her bicycle to get her miles in to be able to do this competition. It's a competition we're in, church. Not against one another, but against the enemy of our souls. There's actually been times in my own life when my passion about God is not as passionate as it should be. I, I sort of let God take second place. And I think we've all felt that way at some time. But the issue is that some Christians allow that feeling of apathy to go deep and long. So we find ourselves in the midst of a long stretch of fairly indif being fairly indifferent about God. Here's what we know we should do. We know that Bible reading, prayer, church involvement, missions, small groups, evangelism, and many other means of grace should capture our heart, but we just don't get excited. I don't care. Let him do it. Let her do it. I don't care. That's apathy. We are spiritually apathetic. We find ourselves feeling helpless to pull ourselves out. And this is a problem in the church. Paul exhorts us to let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. Did you hear that word? Serve. We are to be God's servants. Pastor Wally has said many times that we need to, just like Jesus did on the, the night before he was crucified, he took that towel and wrapped it around him and became a servant and washed the apostles' feet. And yet we're too busy to help our brothers and our sisters. I don't care. That's a problem. Now, here's some things that you might think about to diagnose if you're in that period. If you're in a state of underlying apathy, the first thing you should ask yourself is, am I living in unconfessed sin? If you haven't confessed your sin to God and brought it to Him and asked forgiveness, Hey, you're not going to get the blessings of God. And if we seek to satisfy our sinful desires, we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves distant from God. That's number one thing that help you diagnose. Number two, have I neglected God's means of grace? We often make spiritual growth complicated, but it's not. The basics are simple. If you want to grow in God, here's some very simple things you can do. Read your Bible. How many of us have Bibles laying around our house that we don't read? The words in that Bible are not going to come to you through osmosis. You've got to pick it up and read it. You can pray. Pray every day. 
And not just say, oh, Lord, bless me today. I'm your child. I thank you for all you do. Stop and wait for God to speak to you. He will if you'll give your time to him. Read God's promises and commands and then, excuse me, and then respond to him. Do you remember when Jesus began his ministry and at the end of his ministry and before he began his ministry, what did he do? He prayed. Forty days in the desert he prayed. He studied the word of God, the Old Testament scrolls, and he regularly served others. Learn to love one another better. That's a mantra that our pastor has brought to us, and it's so true. And then three, what fills your mind daily? If God is not filling our thoughts and occupying our attention, then ask yourself, what is? Because we're always being formed and being shaped by everything that holds our gaze or enters our mind. The problem is that we are regularly beckoned to gaze our eyes on the things of the world and things that don't matter. Paul said in, to the church at Colossians, set your mind on things that are above and not on things of earth. What's filling your mind? There was an author by the name of Neil Postman, and he wrote in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. The book was published in 1985. And this was in 1985. He said the public has been amused into indifference. I don't care. Just let the world roll on by. I don't care. Let the church go, but I don't care. That's the problem. Now, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 gives us the solution. Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship, and that's the ESV. The King James actually says, which is your, let me, I, I had it in my mind, I just lost it. Which is your, oh goodness. Well, it simply means that we are to give ourselves to God in service to Him. Your, it says your reasonable service. And that to me says, just do enough to get by. That's, that's, that's what's reasonable. I appeal to you, present your bodies a living sacrifice. The young lady that ran that marathon, she made sacrifices. She didn't have time to go with her friends. She didn't have time to do many things. She had to put some things aside because she was going for a goal. Church, we're going for a goal. Now, we're going to win, but I want to be part of the team. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. How many times have we heard people say, I just wish I knew the will of God. I, I would do it if I knew the will of God then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what a better time in the beginning of the year. Now, I'm not talking about making resolutions. Most people that made resolutions have already broke them anyway. I'm talking about making a commitment to our Father that we will fill our minds with those things that are good, acceptable, and perfect. When the computer world first began, they had some logo that said, Geigo, garbage in, 
garbage out. The same is true in the kingdom of God. If you fill yourself full of garbage, you're going to be a garbage can. And when you're tested, what's going to come out? Garbage. So we find the will of God. We, this is the will of God, that we renew our minds. Science has proven that what you put in your mind is what you live by, what you are, what you feel your mind full of. And so many Christians in this world today don't read His Word. They think it so, well, I don't need to go to church. And this is particularly since COVID happened. So many, and understandably, stayed home from COVID, but it became comfortable. You see, they didn't have to do anything. Didn't even have to get dressed. They could sit in their PJs and watch the service on the computer. But that's not serving. Jesus was a servant, and if we are Christ-like, we will be servants also. And I'm going to quote what Eugene Peterson says in his message, Bible. Same scripture. He said, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into your culture without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And he says, you will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike our culture around us, always dragging you down to the level of immaturity. God brings the best out of us. Develop well-formed maturity in you. Sacrifice. Sometimes it's not comfortable to do what God asks us to do. Sometimes it's not comfortable to help somebody. But we're to wrap that towel around us and get on our knees and wash their feet. In the Old Testament, when they made their sacrifices, they would bring in a lamb. And this lamb would sacrifice, be sacrificed one, they actually would bring in two. One would be set free, carrying the sins away. The other would be killed, his blood upon the altar and on the mercy seat. That was a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice if you give your life. I'm reading right now in some, some church history, and I'm amazed at the amount of men and women in the very first and second and third century that were willing to stand up and give their lives, knowing that they would die. They were not going to give up and quit and say, Oh, king, I would rather serve you. No, sir. Let me die. They died for him. My question is, can we live for him? If you can't live for him, you can't die for him. But you know what he did? He lived for you, and he died for you. There are many, many different religions and ideas of religious means. In fact, there's a new movement going around now called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. In other words, we don't want none of that religion, but they're calling it a church. The man that speaks to him, they call him a pastor. There is one now in Atlanta, according to what I just read. We're living in a world 
that needs God. We need to be the men and women that are telling our children, teaching our children, our grandchildren, anyone we can about the kingdom of God. But before we can do that, we have to show them love. We have to show them love. You see, we were once without God. Somebody told us. And we were able to become a Christian. The world doesn't know him. They don't care. But they can learn to care if you... Sh the, thing, the thing that will tell... That takes somebody from not caring to caring is how you care for them. If you show them love and respect, they'll, be, they'll begin to believe that you care about them. And I hope you do. That's the solution to apathy. If you don't want to live in a, in a spiritual apathy in your life, I have two words. Get busy. Very simple. All the words in the world, it's still very simple. Get busy. Be a servant. A servant of our God. There's much to do, much to do. Our church has grown immensely since Pastor Rod has come when you look at the numbers, but we've still got a long way to go. But it hasn't happened without work. It hasn't happened without sometimes being uncomfortable. But we wrap our towel around us, we get on our knees, and we wash feet. And I'm speaking in a spiritual manner. So I'm going to ask you this morning, I've given you the problem, the problem is apathy, and I've given you the answer by the renewing of your mind, the Word of God. You can renew your mind with garbage. Or you can renew your mind with peace and love and joy in our Savior, thinking about Him, learning about Him, talking to Him, letting Him talk to us. You won't be very apathetic for very long if you're doing those things. You might go into a slump, but you're coming out if you're doing those things. I'm going to pray, and I want you to think about your life. what you've done, what you want to do. Sometimes we ask people to do things and they say, no, I, I, I'm not capable. None of us are without the spirit and power of God. But there's a work to do. Lean in. Journey deeper. I've been a believer most of my life. I'm 75, and I've been a believer since I was about 15 years old. That's a long time. But I'm still looking. I'm still seeking. I'm still searching how I can serve my Lord. And so that's all I'm going to ask you to do. Let's make a change in a new year. Let's run a, or let's compete in a spiritual Ironman competition. You say you can't do it, but you can. You can. It's found on your knees and in His Word. And then, don't just stay on your knees and say, God, go help my neighbor. You get up off your knees, you go help your neighbor. You be that servant that God wants you to be. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning. We see in the church world a great wave of apathy. People not caring. People not committed. 
people that want to be on the fringes of serving God. But Lord, I want to be right in the middle of what you're doing. And though I'm not capable in so many ways, whatever you ask me to do, I am willing to try. I may have to get up before the sun rises and get prepared, and then I might have to prepare all day, and then after supper I might have to prepare some more at night. But I want to be your servant. And I want to fill my mind with the things of God and not the things of the world. They are so enticing. Jesus told the church in Laodicea, you think you're rich, you think everything is well, but you're naked, you're destitute, you're poor, and you don't even know it. Open our eyes, Lord, and let us see. Let us see your glory. Let us see who you are and what you have done. Let us be a part of the, your church that you established when you walked on this earth. And it's been going ever since. The devil has tried to destroy it, but thank God we're still here. And there will always be a remnant of your children. I want to be a part of that remnant, Lord. And I pray for everyone in this congregation this morning that they would just take time to think. Think about what they could do to be your servant. I pray you would bless everyone. Touch everyone. And I'll say it out loud. I need forgiveness for mistakes I've made. I'm not perfect. But I am forgiven. And I know many of us could say the same. But the only way we get better is to practice reading His Word, practice praying, and then practice serving. I want to see your glory. I want to see your presence. Father, I thank you for everyone who's come out this morning. And I just ask a special blessing on them this week. And may something I've said reach their heart and recognize that, yeah, there are problems in the church, but there's also a solution. And it's a simple solution. It's not a resolution. It's a commitment. Bless our church, bless our pastor as they uh, will be journeying back this afternoon. And we just thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. Father, we'll give you the honor and the glory and the power. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed, folks. <laughs>